2 Corinthians chapter 11, starting verse 1 down through verse 4. And this is what it says. When not stand for the reading of God's word. This is what it says. Maybe just drop a bunch of stuff. It says, Would to God ye, sh ye could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. And then, and then look at the warning here in verse 3 and 4. It says, But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtility, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preaches to another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful, Lord. I pray that you bless us. And uh, give us a good time to your word tonight, Lord, to help us to learn something about our Bible. And, uh, Lord, what we need to be standing for, uh, Lord, in these wicked times. And uh, so, Lord, help us to be strengthened. And, uh, Lord, equip us. Lord, I, I mentioned uh, being a militia. And, uh, Lord, something's got to happen. Something needs to be done. And, uh, Lord, there might be some folks that need to rise up and not stand for what we are seeing going on, especially if it's allowed to continue on. And so, Lord, I pray that you speak to your hearts. Help us, Lord, know how we can take a stand uh, for you. Uh, but take a stand also, Lord, for our rights. And again, we're thankful for your mercy, your goodness. Bless us now. We pray all, uh, all this in your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, we might be coming into a time, you can be seated, into a time where, where um, we better get settled on um, what we stand on and what we believe. As believers, what is, uh, let me ask you a question. As believers, what do you think the greatest asset you have to anchor your faith in? Now, don't say anything just yet. Uh, some might say, well, myself, my belief. And, but really, that can wane on a bad day. Your faith. Uh, can wane on a bad day, meaning uh, you could wake up one morning and, and uh, not feel like you felt when you went to bed, as far as your, your faith and, and your stand with God and all that. Uh, some may say, well, we have the Holy Spirit, but the Bible says we can grieve Him. How many of you have ever had the Holy Spirit? Uh, we're all supposed to if we're saved, but how many of uh, many times... Uh, when you're praying or, or have been through some troubles in your life and you're praying and it seems like your prayers are just bouncing off the ceiling and uh, you feel alone and uh, I'm sure we've all went through that and the Bible says that we can grieve him now uh, the answer that we're looking for uh, turn to, turn to uh, Romans chapter 10 keep there where you're at where we can come back to it if we need to uh, put a ribbon there or a track there David's got plenty of tracks passed around if you need one he just threw a bunch on the floor. Uh, Romans chapter 10 and uh, verse 17. Look what it says. Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. Um, you probably don't even really need to read it. You can quote it. Um, most of it, us probably could. It says, So then faith cometh by hearing. And hearing by what? The word. Hearing by the word. So faith cometh by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. And, and so there's... Uh, our answer, but what what, I'm, what what we need to realize, and and Salt reminded me the other day when Christine called me and said, by by the way, some man is sitting in the parking lot, and he asked me a bunch of questions, and I just want to kind of let you know uh, what was said and, and uh, what he asked and all that kind of stuff, and because uh, we're kind of we're kind of I don't know um, we're kind of just watching carefully what's going on and, and uh, especially if uh, somebody calls that's not in a local area I believe she said when the, fall, uh, the call came into the church phone it was a 313 area and I think one of the questions he, the first questions he asked is what we're doing for COVID and all that kind of thing well that's for a cause for concern because last thing we need is a bunch of Nazi police coming up uh, as far as COVID police and telling us how we you know, we can't do this, we can't do that. And so, you know, we were kind of um, carefully answering any questions. Uh, if someone calls and says, are you guys having church? And if you are, what are you doing for precautions for COVID and all that kind of stuff? And so anyway, this guy calls 
And, uh, and it, it went into farther than that as far as talking about COVID. But what I'm getting at is one of the things that came up was uh, kind of a, a, an attack on our Bible. Now, are you guys one of those King James churches? Well, when you say one of those King James churches, that kind of, well, that kind of puts you on the defensive. And uh, he had made a comment to her, well, you know that the King James has been changed many times. Now, the, fir the first thing I got to thinking about is any man that calls a church seeking for uh, what that church believes and wanting to ask questions about where that church stands on particular things, um, any man that calls and, and, and banters back and forth with a woman, is not much of a man. And, and not only that, but then you wonder who he is. Uh, who did Satan go to? When you go to the beginning of the Bible, uh, Satan, rather than go to Adam, he went to Eve. And there was a purpose for that. And, and yes, it says that Eve is the weaker vessel, but there's more to it than that. There's a reason why he went to her. And uh, so, so that's probably one of the things that I was said that the guy was coming tonight. Um, and I'm preaching this like I would have preached if he was sitting here. And, uh, but anyway, um, so you better be ready to battle um, for his work. Because like I said, as believers, what is the greatest asset you have to anchor your faith in? It's not, your, it's not yourself. It's not what you believe. It's not the Holy Spirit. Although the Holy Spirit is in us. And but but, but we can we can uh, we can our faith can wane. The Holy Spirit we can grieve Him, and so what we really have the Bible tells us is His Word. Look what it says again, Romans chapter ten verse seventeen. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. First John chapter uh, five and verse thirteen. And I hope that you guys. Uh, write these verses down if you don't already have them written in your Bibles or marked in your Bibles. Uh, but these are some of the most basic verses that we need to know. Uh, First John chapter 5, verse 13 says, These things have I written unto you that, yeah, that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. And so as we read that, um, we need to realize we better be ready uh, to battle for his preserved work. For his work. You're going to be attacked all the time. And, and, uh, and if you don't, um, uh, we need to be because that's where you're always going to be attacked. I mean, what would you say? Like what Christine went through. What would you say if, they, if someone says the King James Bible has been changed? So did he say how many times? Were, huh? Was it 16 times? I, I put in my notes some 20 times uh, since its inception. <clears throat> you know, it's quite easy to explain. Uh, uh, the change, changes and revisions are due to style changes. Um, I brought my little 1611 edition, and I wanted to read something out of here. Um, uh, this is my 1611, and what's interesting about it is, is you can go to the very beginning, uh, the preface, and this is what it says. It says, um, the, ver this, the version of 1611, here after the KJV, is the standard by which all other English Bible translations are measured. However, until the advent of modern pho uh, phonomechanical printing processes and digital data achieving no two printing... Let me back up. However, so it says... It says the King James Bible is the standard of all Bibles that all Bibles try to compete with. And, and it says it's the standard by which all other English uh, Bible translations are measured. But it says, however, until the advent of modern uh, uh, photomechanical printing processes and digital data uh, uh, archiving, no two printings of the KJV were precisely the same. Now you might say, oh, then, then they're right. But, but listen what it talks about. It says, English spelling was fluid in the 16th and 17th centuries. And even a pronoun as simple as the masculine singular could be spelled. What's masculine singular? He. He. Right. We've got to do it. It could be spelled um, three different ways. 
It could be H-E or H-E-E -E or H-I-E back in those days, back in 1611. And it says printers often, uh, scholars in their own right, saw no problem in changing spelling and punctuation as they, uh, as they typeset their editions. This practice of intentional changes, as well as the introduction of the unintentional errors, led to significant official revisions in the last, uh, no, uh, uh, no, it says led to significant official revisions in the last three centuries, the last 300 years, as Pollard notes in his introduction. And so what I'm saying is, what does that tell you? That yes, the, the King James Bible has been revised, but the revisions have been simply because of how words have been spelled. They didn't change the words. They just, through time, uh, you know, we've come to a more standard spelling. And, and, and listen to this. F.H.A. Scribner uh, lists several important additions of the KJV he used in developing the Cambridge Paragraph Bible of 1873 including two considerable efforts to improve and correct our ordinary editions of Holy Scripture made in 1762 by Dr. Paris and Dr. Blaney, whose labors were published in 1769. Then all them dates sound familiar, don't they, David? 1769, uh, 1873, because them are all uh, editions of the King James Bible. That's what Mr. Big, Dr. Big Bottoms, when he was talking to you about, was talking about, you know, have you, did you know the King James Bible has been changed some 16 times? And and so, and so I did just that. I looked it up because I know what the changes are. Um, and it says Paris's edition was published by Cambridge University, as was Scribner's, while Blaney's edition was published by Oxford. Scribner's uh, collation of the variations in KJV editions that preceded him filled 37 pages of appendices. But his seven years of focused research and careful documentation did not settle the, the text of the KGB once and for all. David Norton, editor of the New Cambridge Parallel Bible, believes Scrib Scribner, now listen to what happened. Scribner unnecessarily revised the text beyond correcting printer's errors and unhelpfully reverted to archaic spellings and wordings. So what we're talking about is, uh, is, is changing words uh, so that they're familiar to us because through the time, uh, words in, in, the words didn't change, but the spelling of the word did. Um, I have in my notes, uh, the changes in word work involve word spellings and letter shapes. In other words, if, if you take this Bible, this seems like it'd be an easy Bible to read. Pick it up and try to read it. Oh my goodness. It's terrible when you try to read it. I mean, it, it, it I, you know, I got it just for this purpose. So that if somebody said something about the, the originals, uh, King James that is, that I could look at it and say, well, well, here's the differences. I have one of the original first editions of the 1611, and you can see why they made changes. Because as our, as our spellings changed, the words didn't change, but the spellings of the words did. did. Matter of fact, um, in that Bible, anybody know what this word is? Genesis. Yes. But you know how it's spelled in the old Bible? Genesis. It's because of the way they did it. It's, it's the way they, they used uh, uh, different letters. Um, in genealogy, remind me how to spell it when I get over here. Is that right? No. no. Um, how was it? O L O G Y. O L. Right here? Yeah. I thought there was an A in it. Or an A in I should have just took my nose over there. Somebody look it up. Yeah, imagine one because it talks about genomes. But in, in the old, I'll tell you, I'll show you how it's spelled in the old. Here's how it's spelled in that Bible. I found it, yeah. I found generation, not genome. 
um, uh, ark, the ark, like the uh, Noah's ark. I like Arky Arky. What wasn't there a song? Arky Arky. I like that picture. So, and then uh, oh, Acts, the book of Acts. You know how it was spelled in that Bible? A C T E S. Actes. Actes. Yes. And and another thing is. Um, <clears throat> Anything that had a, a U in it? Name me a give me a U word out of the Bible. Uzzah. 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 Yeah. So it'd be it'd be it like a Like a Yeah. <laughs> that all your U's back then were shaped like a B. You know? And so what are you getting at, Pastor? Well, what I'm getting at is, is you had to have revisions to modernize it for, you know, our language didn't change in the sense of the words, but it changed in the sense of spellings. And, and let me read this. John 3, 16, I'll read it just like it's written. For God so loved, and, and uh, the, back in this Bible, was just a why. So God so loved, and, and it's loud. God so loved the world, because it's not a B, it's a U. Because B, B's and U's were, were some of the, or is that common? And so God so loved the world that he gaul, because it's not, it's not a B, it's a G-A-U-E, but it's B. I mean, they would know it was a B. So, uh, and so all the way through, we would not know how to read the 1611. They did back then, but because it, revisions brought it to as, as modernity came, so to speak, um, slight changes were made. And so what do you get at? Well, what, I, what I'm trying to get at is these revisions in our Bibles are easy to explain. And, and the best way to write it down is, well, well yes, of course, there was changes and revisions due to style changes uh, that happened over the centuries. And that's really what it is. It's style. It's not that the words really change, it's the, the letter shapes and, and the, the style changed, you see. And, and so that's a good way to explain it. Now, um, I want to make a statement uh, tonight, and, and um, you've, heard, you've heard me make this statement before. And it is this, you, we better get settled on 2 Timothy 2.15 in the sense of so that I was approved unto God at work when it needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We better get settled on that verse and learning how to rightly divide. If not, then we're going to get slayed by 1 Peter 5.8. I've used that, that expression before. 1 Peter 5.8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion. Walketh about seeking whom he may have power. We had the devil sitting out in the parking lot. Amen. Now, that guy might not know that. Uh, if he was here, I'd say it, you know, and I might smile at him. But I, I want to get the point across that, you know, number one, you don't call our church and ask theological questions and then start, you know, and especially talking to my wife or the church secretary or someone who's answering the phone. I mean, I mean, that's just, how would you say it? it? It shows a weakness on his part. And not only that, he's being used as a tool of the death. Amen. And so, and so, um, so how do we back? We're going to look at that a little bit tonight. Um, when, when believers doubt, it's not like uh, unbelievers. Although our doubt is real, our... Um, because of our special relationship with God, uh, we have a, spe a specific way we'll do battle. And turn to Romans chapter 8, verse 16. Romans chapter 8 and verse 16. Look at what it says. It says, The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. 
And so here's the simple truth. What I've noticed is when, when this world attacks, you and the devil is behind it, they only have one thing they can attack. Yes. And it's what they'll attack. Now, now he was asking questions about other things, but why, why, why would somebody out of nowhere say, but you know, oh, so you, you guys use the King James Bible, yes, but you know that there's many revisions to that. Did you know there's many changes? You know, yea, hath God said. That's, that's, I mean, that's what they're going to attack. They're going to attack your book. Because it's what we have. It's all we have when it comes right down to it. Now, when I, when I mean the Bible is true, I want to show you four things tonight, real simple, things I, I've taught on, preached on uh, before, uh, how we can know that the Bible is true. And, and the first thing is this. Um, the Bible is true because it's God's revelation of, it, uh, of himself. Now, let me explain that. Uh, turn to Deuteronomy chapter two, uh, 32. What we need to realize is God is truth. Amen. And so when you think about the Bible, when you think about God's word, I mean, that's what this is all about. This, this, uh, this is our way of coming to know God. Amen. So when you turn to Deuteronomy in chapter uh, 32, look at what it says. Chapter 32 in verses 1 through 4. I just got done reading Deuteronomy. And uh, verses 1 through 4, it says, uh, Give ear, O heavens, and I will speak, and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall drop as the rain, my speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass. Because I will publish the name of the Lord, ascribe me greatness unto our God. He is the rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are judgment, a God of truth, and without iniquity, just and right is he. And, and so look at what that says. Here's what God's word tells us about God. It says again in verse 4, he is the rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are judgment, a God of truth and, and without iniquity, just and right is he. Now, and so when we read that, just like I said, the Bible's true because it's God's revelation of himself. In other words, what's the Bible about? It's about God, and it tells us about God. And of course, if, if God is truth, then his Bible is truth. Amen. Amen. Now look at John chapter uh, 4. Go to the Gospel of John in chapter 4. Look what it says. The Gospel of John in uh, chapter 4. In uh, verse 24, it says, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And so we know that God is truth. We know that his word is truth. And how we have to come to know God and to worship God is through truth. Where do we get truth? The Bible. The Bible. Amen. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And uh, look what it says. First Thessalonians chapter 2. Oh, my pages are getting so torn up. First Thessalonians chapter 2. In uh, verse 13, it says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because uh, when we, when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. And so we kind of come the whole gamut just in those uh, three or four verses that tell us who God is, that God's word is truth. And that when we come through here, uh, again it says, uh, it says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when we receive the word of God, which he heard of us, he received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. 
Now, when you think of that Romans chapter 10, uh, verse 17 again, for uh, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Is that correct? Right. Yes. And, and so when we think about that, what I'm getting at is, do you get it? He is the God of truth, the spirit of truth, the word and the words of truth. Now, I'll turn to Psalm uh, 12. And you guys know this verse. Psalm 12, 6 and 7. Look what it says. Psalm 12, 6 and 7. The words of the Lord are pure words, as so are tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. And so when we read that, what we need to realize is the Bible is eternally settled. Uh, when it talks about that right there, it tells us that it's pure and that it's preserved. And the Bible is, again, eternally uh, settled. When I, uh, you're in Psalm anyway, turn to Psalm 119. Look what it says. Yeah. Psalm 119 in verse uh, 89. It says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Now, now get this. I, I did some digging through some of my Sunday school lessons and all that and uh, uh, about the, the library of the 66 books of the Bible. And, and, and this was the statement that I dug up. The Bible is a library of 66 books written by 40 uh, authors over a period of 1,500 years representing every cross-section of humanity, educated, non-educated, yet in full harmony. Right. And, and when, when you think about what it means to say that the Bible is inspired, it doesn't mean the writers wrote by natural inspiration or writers wrote by their will uh, what they believe God meant. In, in 2 Peter chapter 20, 121, it says, Holy men of God. It means safe men set apart by God. Or, or I should say men being used by God, set apart by God. And they spake as they were moved. They were used as instruments. And David was a perfect example. In uh, 2 Samuel 23, 2, it says, The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. So the Holy Spirit then is the author. Man uh, many times is used as the instrument used by the Holy Spirit simply to record and the result is the infallible word of God. And, and when he says in Psalm uh, 12, 6, and 7, when he's talking about the preservation of his word, it's no less miraculous in a version. And in that Psalm 119, 89 again says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is set. That's why God could say uh, in Psalm 12, 6, and 7, uh, the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver dried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. He was and always will be in complete control of them. Amen. He has all history, past, present, and future in view. And the scripture is always relevant. Don't ever let anyone say God's word is in outdated, inaccurate, uh, changed. I mean, listen to what Romans 15, 4 says. For what sort of things were written aforetime were written for our learning and we through patience and comfort of the scriptures that we might have hope. So the Bible's infallible. We hear this all the time. But do we really understand what it's saying? Infallible means, when I looked it up, not fallible, not capable of erring, entirely exempt from liability to mistake. Now, constantly people will say the Bible is full of mistakes. Amen. I'm sure that guy, um, if you'd ask him, do you think the Bible has, you know, is it perfect? Is there, you know, is, is it inerrant and invalid? I bet anybody would say, well, there's mistakes in it. There's, there's mistranslations and all that kind of stuff is probably what he would say. And, and what I would say to anybody is this, name one. Name an error. Name where you think there's an error. And they, they never can. And if they could point out one that they think is a discrepancy or an error or a contradiction, there's always an answer in God's words. Uh, Dr. Ruckman wrote a book called Errors in the KJV. And it deals with every discrepancy. I mean, way beyond what anybody normal thinks about. I mean, he was so far into it 
you know, not that I worship him or anything like that, but he was a smart man, and he was an avid Bible reader. I mean, that's why I desired by some of the men. I mean, Don Green was a good friend with uh, Dr. Ruckman, and uh, I think that's probably what brought uh, the idea of reading your Bible from front to back and reading it, you know, 10 chapters a day. I think that probably originated through Dr. Ruckman. Now, Dr. Green read his Bible hundreds of times. And, and so people who do that kind of congregate together. And, and so they ran together for a long time. And, uh, but anyway, uh, Dr. Ruckman wrote a book called Heirs of the KJV that deal with every discrepancy, ones that we can we wouldn't even think of. And, and I mean, it's just amazing. So what I'm saying is there's resources out there that you have every answer you need to deal with somebody. See, the, the Holy Spirit wants us to adopt the same view of the scriptures that Jesus taught during his earthly ministry. Turn to Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12 for a second. Mark chapter 12 in your New Testament. Look what it says. Mark chapter 12. In uh, verse 36, it says, For David himself said, By the Holy Ghost, the Lord said to my Lord, uh, Sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstools. Who said that? Who, who's saying this, though, here? Yeah, Jesus. And so when we read that, what he's talking about is how David was infallibly inspired. That's that psalm. Uh, 1101. If you don't have it in your notes, write it right there by that verse. That it's Psalm 1101. It's the it's it's the Old Testament illustration. Psalm 1101 is the Old Testament illustration of 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture given in by inspiration of God, proud for doctrine, for proof, correction, for instruction in righteousness. And and so Jesus taught that uh, the New Testament would be the same, even though it wasn't pinned yet. Um, turn to John chapter 16. Because I know there's questions about this too. Well, that's talking, whenever Christ was talking about Scripture, he was always talking about the Old Testament. What about the New Testament? Well, look at what John 16, uh, verses 12 through 13 say. John chapter 16, verse 12 says, I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. How be it when he, the Spirit, of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Now, who do you think of? The, uh, no, the Holy Spirit. But who do you think of that, that the Holy Spirit showed things to come? That's a major part of our Bible. Do you think, do you think Revelation is an inspired book? Absolutely. I mean, I mean, that's John right here. This is, you know, this is John writing this, but, but John experienced this some, what, 60 years after Christ went to the cross when he wrote the book of Revelation. And just like it says here, how be it when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. I mean, if that ain't, if that ain't the book of Revelation, think how important the book of Revelation is. Yet it was, again, pinned some 60 years after the crucifixion of Christ. And Christ was saying, hey man, that, that uh, it is inspiration inspired. Hey Amen. Now, I know some say, I understand that preacher, but what about the King James Bible itself? I mean, what, what I would say is God claimed inspiration for the Bible, King James Bible too. I know that sounds crazy, but listen again to Psalm 12, 6, and 7. The words of the Lord appear, words of silver tried, uh, and a furnace of earth purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them uh, from this generation forever. Now, what I'm saying in closing is this. Don't listen to the TR crowd. David, do you know what the TR crowd is? Yes. What they, or, or, or the originals crowd. Because you know, they have no clue what they're talking about. That's right. Because even if they could put a preserved, complete, because what I would say to anybody that says, did you know the King James Bible has been changed many times? 
what that is is somebody that's seeking the authority. That's right. And what they're doing is what I would say to them is, well, then what do you rely on? The yes, the originals. And I'll say, where are they? can you put it in my hand? And they can't. You know, they might think they can. Well, I have. It's, it's like what they need to realize is, like I said, when Dr. Big Bottoms rags about studying the originals, um, I, I kind of worldly um, started to learn my Greek alphabet. And I, I didn't really learn it, I just learned to memorize it. And the reason I wanted to do that is because we were dealing, we started dealing with some, some Jehovah's Witness people that would come to our door, and we were having fun witnessing to them and battling with them at our doorstep. And Miss Christine was really battling with them. And she had a man come to her, her door uh, when she was battling with, and the guy said, well, I studied the originals. And she called him up, she outright called him a liar. And come to find out, he couldn't even speak the originals, could he? Yeah, and he didn't know it. And so what I'm, what I'm getting at is if Dr. Big Bottoms brags about studying the originals, all you going to do is ask them, okay, recite me the Greek alphabet. Well, you know, all you get is a duh. So then what you'd say to them, so you study the originals and don't even know the Hebrew or Greek alphabet. How is that so? I mean, you're not, and so what, what it comes down to, and that's what this Jehovah's Witness dude was saying, what, what he got caught doing, is when, when people are saying they're studying the originals, what they're doing is they're following a man who knows the original languages and, and has, has taken the, the broken up originals and try to uh, interpret their, their uh, how would I say it, their scholarly view into the Bible. They're the ones that will say, well, that word there, replenish, in, the, in Genesis chapter 1, is kind of a misfortunate translation. It's an unfortunate way that, that they translate. No, it was translated the exact way it was supposed to be translated. Amen. God allowed it. And so what I'm saying is, is most of most these guys, like, I'm sure this guy would be one of those original guys. If he's questioning the King James Bible, what he's doing is trying to take our authority and place it on either himself or some other man, and parroting some other man. And that's what, we, what they're doing. And so what I'm getting at in closing is this. The Bible has been preserved. Amen. Yes, there's been some, there's been some version changes. And remember what I said? It's simply because of uh, the way they used letters back then. But the words haven't changed. Um, there's some paragraph changing. And so we have a preserved Bible. Amen. The Bible has been preserved. And, and why again? Because the Bible is a revelation of himself. And himself being perfect, he wouldn't have anything else but a perfect book. And he promises that. Amen. Matthew 5, 18 says, For verily I send you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law until all be fulfilled. Amen. Let's pray. Father, again, we're grateful, Lord, I pray. Lord, that you continue to bless us. And Lord, we're